when my heart is overwhelmed. David writes, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a refuge for me and a strong tower against my enemies. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Increase the days of my life, my years for many generations. Let me be in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and mercy to protect me. Then I will ever sing praise to your name. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come before you this morning. And Father, we thank you that you are a very present help in time of trouble. Lord, today in Jesus' name, we pray for your peace over our hearts. And we pray for your peace, God, to settle on the families of Sandy Hook Elementary School. Lord, we pray for your comfort to come to the town of Newtown, Connecticut. Lord, help us this morning as our hearts are overwhelmed. In Jesus' name, amen. For the last few weeks, we have been journeying together through the book of Acts. And I had all prepared a great word to bring you from Acts chapter 6. But that's going to wait for another Sunday. Instead, I want to talk for a while, and I especially want us to pray together uh, about the shooting in Newtown, Connecticut on Friday. There are absolutely no words to express the grief that we feel over the loss of 20 young lives and their teachers and their principal. We can honestly say with David this morning, Lord, our hearts are overwhelmed. What can we do? A few thoughts that I want to offer this morning before we pray. What can I do when my heart is overwhelmed? First, as I look at the words of David, I find that it's important to release the grief. Release the grief. Hear my cries, O oh God. You know, as a pastor, I find that born-again Christians are sometimes less healthy about expressing grief than are others. It's almost as if we feel that to grieve is somehow a compromise of our faith in God. After all, we're supposed to be always joyful. We're supposed to be always thankful. We're supposed to be always hopeful. We are more than conquerors. Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph. When something like this happens, sometimes there's a tendency for us to repress our grief. We stuff it. We feel guilty over it. Sometimes we hang on to it inside and mentally we rehearse it again and again. But God says, release the grief. Let it out. Weep with those who weep. You know, Paul never said that we shouldn't grieve. It's true that he did say that we don't grieve like others who don't have hope in the face of death, but we still grieve. Just because we know that one day we win in the end doesn't mean that we don't feel deeply our losses today. This has been a weekend for grieving. I cried Friday afternoon when I picked up my kids at school and I saw their innocent faces, all the kids out on the sidewalk waiting for their moms and dads and they were happy and excited. It was Friday afternoon, Christmas is, is on the way. They had no idea about the horror that happened just a few miles up the road in the morning. I cried when I saw the distraught photos of the parents outside of Sandy Hook Elementary School waiting to hear whether their child was alive or dead. I cried when I saw our president lose it at a press conference. I don't think I've ever seen that in my life. I cried when I saw the Monsignor in Newtown trying to hold it together after a night of telling parents one after another in the firehouse 
that their little kids were never coming home from school. I cried on Friday night when I peeked in the doors uh, of my kids' bedrooms and saw them sleeping peacefully. I love the, their little heads sticking out from the covers. I love to just look at my kids when they're sleeping, and I thought of 20 beds that were empty and little heads that would never go on their pillow again. You know, the worst isn't over yet. There's still more grief to come this week as one by one, 20 little caskets are buried in the ground just days before Christmas. Release the grief. Cry it out. And as you cry it out, cry up to God. Hear my cry, O oh God. When my heart is overwhelmed, I cry unto you. As you grieve, realize that God is aware. Job said, you keep a close watch on all my paths. God sees, God knows. Jesus says, not even a little sparrow falls to the ground, but that God knows it. And how much more valuable are we than a little sparrow? God is aware and God cares. Jesus wept when he saw the grief of his friends, Mary and Martha, over the loss of their brother, Hebrews says that Jesus is our great high priest who is touched with the feelings of our humanity because he himself experienced life on earth as a man. His heart resonates with ours. When we're joyful, he feels it. When we're in mourning and grieving, he feels it. David said the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. God is aware, God cares, and God is there. David said here, God, it feels like you're a million miles away from me today. From the ends of the earth, I cry out to you. God, I feel like uh, you and I are as far apart as we could be. It felt like God was far away from Newtown, Connecticut on Friday morning. But David reminded himself in another place, God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, I will not be afraid when tragedy strikes. Beloved, it's okay to release the grief. In fact, we must release the grief. But while you cry it out, cry up to God who is aware and who cares and who's there. What can I do when my heart is overwhelmed? Second, receive support from other brothers and sisters. Receive support from other brothers and sisters. In moments like these, I am so thankful for the family of God. Honestly, I don't know what people do without the Lord and without a church family. If I couldn't come to church at a time like this, I don't know where on earth I would go. Do you see the whole town of Newtown flocked to the church on Friday evening? You know, next to belonging to Him, the second best thing on earth is belonging to one another in Him. In God's family, we receive perspective from others who have overcome. Paul said that the God of all comfort comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others with the same comfort that we ourselves have received from God. You see, the comfort that we have received in our sorrow, in our loss, becomes a reservoir inside of us from which we can then minister to others. Beloved, I want to tell you, if in your life you have passed through deep waters, if you've passed through sorrows and troubles and trials, be thankful. Because now there is a reservoir of holy hope inside of you from which you can minister to others at a time like this. So moved by the stories that just keep coming out of heroism, of courage, moved by the story of one teacher who herded 15 first graders into a bathroom and locked the door. 
And she kept saying to them while the gunfire could be heard out in the hallway, I promise you, you're going to be all right. I promise you, you're going to be all right. Beloved, in times of crisis in our lives, during the firestorm, God uses people in his family to reassure us and tell us, I promise you, you're going to be all right. I wonder who's here today. And God has helped you through a crisis. You suffered a loss. God took someone home that you loved. You suffered through divorce. You, you suffered through problems with your kids, financial setbacks, health crises. And God has brought you through. God has comforted you. God has sustained you. God has helped you. God has healed you. I wonder who in this house you have that testimony. In fact, if that's your testimony, I want you to stand up on your feet right now. You can say, God has brought me through. Stay standing for, stay standing for just one moment. I want you to look around for a minute. Just look at one another. Now, I wonder if there's someone here this morning and you could say, right now, I'm going through it. Right now, I need help. Right now, I need an answer from God. Right now, I want you to lift your hand up high. Lift it. Would you do that? Lift your hand up high. I want those of you that are standing, look around, and I want you to find one of these people. We're going to do something, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to come do something special right now. Find one of these people. Go to them. Quick, quick. Find them and put your hand on their shoulder. Come on, every, everyone that has a, a hand up in the air, find, find them and put your hand on their shoulder. Listen, you're going to say something. You're going to make a, a proclamation of faith right now. And when you do, the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to strengthen you in your innermost being with the strength that comes from the Holy Spirit. Those of you that have the testimony, God has brought me through. I want you to look right in the eyes of that person that you're laying your hands on. And I want you to tell them right now, I promise you, you're going to make it. I promise you, you're going to make it. Now stay right there, hold that pose, because not only in God's family do we receive perspective, but in God's family we also receive the prayers of others that help us overcome. James said, pray for one another to be healed, for the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And so I want you, while you still have your hands on that person right now, I want you in 10 seconds, I want you to say a prayer in the name of Jesus for healing, for help, for hope, for breakthrough, for an answer, for God to come and to make a change. Come on, do it right now. Thank you, Jesus. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you are the God of all comfort. I thank you, God, that you comfort us in all of our troubles, Lord. There isn't a trouble we can experience that is beyond your ability to bring help and hope and aid. And I thank you for releasing right now, in the name of Jesus, answers to prayers, miracles, breakthroughs. Thank you for releasing changes in situations, God, changes in atmosphere and attitude, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for just answering prayer right now, in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a big praise right now in this place. You may be seated for another minute or two or three or four. What can I do when my heart is overwhelmed? Third, this, refuse to give in to bitterness. Refuse to give in to bitterness. Hebrews says, watch out that no bitterness take root among you. It causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. How do we keep from becoming bitter? First of all, I think that we have to learn how to commit to God what has been lost. Commit to God what you don't understand. Commit to God what you cannot change, what you cannot undo. In moments like these, some people want to be angry at God. I find it ironic that they want to be angry at a God that they don't even believe exists. Rather predictably, Bill Maher spouted off yesterday, prayer and hugging your kids won't fix anything. 
One night a dad was reading a children's Bible to his little toddler at bedtime. He was reading the creation story out of Genesis. And so he asked his little son, Luke, who made the stars? And the little boy giggled and laughed and said to his father, Luke did. And the dad said, no, Luke, God did. Then he said, Luke, who made the oceans and the mountains and the sky? And the little boy laughed again and he said, Luke did. And the dad said, no, Luke, God did. Then he asked again, Luke, who made the animals and the fish and the birds? And again, the boy laughed and he said, Luke did. And the father said, no, Luke, God did. The next morning, the dad came down into the kitchen and he found Luke sitting at the table with his cup of milk tipped over, was running all over off the edges and onto the floor. And so the dad asked him very sternly, Luke, who spilled the milk? And the little boy looked up ever so sweetly and he said, God did. <laughs> you know, that's what we do so many times. We live as if God isn't there. We fail to give him the thanks. We fail to give him the credit for blessings every day. But we're quick to blame God for being absent the moment that tragedy strikes. Since Friday, there's been a whole spectrum of emotions out there on Twitter and Facebook and in the media. And depending on how God has wired us, we all respond differently to our grief. Some people respond to grief with this uh, natural uh, inclination to nurture uh, and to, to love and to pour out healing. Some of us express our grief through anger at such senseless bloodshed. Some of us are, are wired to want to act. We're wired to want to take control. Give me some way to fix this. If I may confess to you, when tragedies like this occur, I struggle with a tremendous out of, amount of frustration over the rapidly deteriorating state of our country. So far in 2012, 88 people have lost their lives in shooting incidents like this. 60 died in 2011. Movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, 12 dead, 58 wounded. A high school in Chardon, Ohio, 3 dead. A hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1 dead, 7 wounded. A courthouse in Tulsa, 3 dead. A pharmacy on Long Island, 4 dead. A Pathmark store in Old Bridge, New Jersey, 3 dead. Outside the Empire State Building, 2 dead, 9 wounded. A Sikh temple in Wisconsin, 6 dead. And just a few days ago, a shopping mall in Oregon, two dead. Beloved, can I tell you that there is a whole generation of angry young men out there who desperately need Jesus. This is the fruit of fatherlessness in America. This is the fruit of failed marriages and shattered families and blended and re-blended and re-blended families until they're liquefied. This is the fruit of detachment from reality. When will we begin to seriously address the effect of violent video games and electronics and pornography and sensational entertainment on the minds of young children and adolescents who do not have the ability to distinguish between fantasy and reality. This is the fruit of feasting our eyes on violence and gore and things that are spiritually dark. Beloved, may God give you faith in your heart to believe that what his word says is actually true. Whatever you fix your mind on, whatever you fill your mind with and your spirit with is what you become. Jacob took sticks and he uh, cut stripes in the bark and he put them in front of the eyes of the cattle as they were mating. And guess what? They gave birth to striped and spotted and speckled calves. 
It's a spiritual truth. Whatever you fix your eyes on is what you will eventually give birth to. This is the fruit of narcissism and rampant materialism. This is the fruit of overindulgence and lack of discipline. This is the fruit of substance dependence and substance abuse. Do you know that half of all Americans are dependent on some kind of pill to go to sleep at night and to wake them up again in the morning, to keep them calm during the day, to give them a boost of energy in the afternoon, uppers and downers and in-betweeners and side-deciders. This is the fruit of a spiritual void. There's no clear consensus, it seems, about banning guns, but we have been very clear about banning God. And this is the fruit. A few years ago, I was at a meeting with Chuck Colson, great, great soldier for the Lord. He recently went home. But Chuck Colson was talking about the generation of then 10 to 14 year old boys. And he said, watch out. He said, there is coming the most emotionally unstable, desensitized, and violent generation ever in the history of America. Beloved, I want to tell you, America is sick. We need revival. We need a spiritual awakening. And sometimes I struggle with frustration when even those in the body of Christ continue to enthusiastically drink the Kool-Aid that is poisoning our country. I long to see God's people in the church interceding rather than out there wallowing in the darkness. We cannot change what has happened this year. We can't undo what has been done. We can't bring back the lives that have been lost. We can't do anything else but commit them to God. But there is something that we can do. How do we guard ourselves from bitterness? We commit to God what has been lost, but we focus on healing what is left. Our hearts are broken over 20 children who are never coming home from school. But we're thankful this morning that 500 others did. We're thankful for the bravery of administrators and school teachers and staff and student whose courage under fire saved lives. We're thankful that lockdown drills in October saved lives on Friday morning. We're thankful for the first responders for police and fire and EMTs, state and federal authorities. We're thankful for dedicated professionals that are working all through the weekend so that a mom and dad can hold their baby for one last time. Commit to God what has been lost and focus on healing what is left. Not only are we thankful for the people that are left, but we're thankful that we still have left the powerful vehicles of prayer and the love of God. Bill Maher is wrong. Not only can prayer and love fix this, prayer and love are the only thing that can fix this. What can I do when my heart is overwhelmed? Fourth, Remember what's truly important. Remember what's truly important. Tragedies instantly refocus us on what's really important. How often in life do we neglect what's ultimately important for what is momentarily urgent but ridiculously unimportant? Such a busy time of year this is. So many things on our minds work to finish before the holidays and the end of the year. Shopping to complete preparations to be made, obligations to be met, bills to be paid. And in one split second on Friday, everything that seemed so urgent in one moment was utterly meaningless in the next. Denise and I had an appointment in the city first thing Friday morning. 
and it, it was a huge rush to get out the door so we'd make our appointment on time. Lolly was supposed to have a viola lesson uh, early at school. That didn't happen. We had all kinds of problems. We had double knotted shoelace problems. We had winter coat zipper problems. We had matching mitten problems. We had who's sitting where in the car problems. We have this dog. He's recovering from a broken pelvis and he has to be taken out in a sling. And so I had to carry the dog out in a sling and then wait. I wish you could just push a button, make the dog do his business. He's got to sniff, right? I don't have time, Jack, for you to sniff. I got to go. And to boot, I was low on gas. Didn't even have a proper time for a, a goodbye. When I pulled up at the curb at school, I pushed my kids out the door and said, Jesus loves you, go. In the morning, all I could think about was getting the kids out. But by the afternoon, 3.15 couldn't come soon enough for me to take them in my arms. Remember what's truly important, like family first. Beloved, can I tell you, we have sacrificed our children for material things. The appetite to live in the right house filled with the right stuff and to wear the right clothes and to drive the right cars and to take the right vacations has pushed us into an overworked, stressed out lifestyle that God never wanted for us. We neglect to give our kids what they need the most in order to lavish on them what they really don't need at all. I hate to burst your bubble, but that little apple, whatever it is that you bought to go under the tree on Christmas morning will be obsolete a year from now and you still be paying the interest on it. Who taught our kids that people are secondary in importance? We did. But we can change that. You could have more time with your kids if you were willing to settle for less for a little while. I know some of you are beyond those years already. You've already raised your family. Now you're, you're, you're helping your kids fix all the mistakes you made. I know some of you haven't waded into those waters, but let me speak on behalf of those that are raising kids this morning. In the grand scheme of your life, what is the tiny 18-year window that you have your kids in your home and then they're gone forever. How about if you drive that old jalopy for another year or two or three and come home for dinner every night instead? How about if you throw a slip cover over that old sofa for another year or two and sit down on it and have a family game on the coffee table? How about if you forget about the next generation iPad, iPod, iPhone, I, 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 <laughs> and you have some us time instead. And for heaven's sake, make sure you pray over your children every morning before they leave your door. Make sure you pray over your spouse and bless him or, or bless her. Make sure you take every opportunity to tell your family you love them. Don't take for granted that you'll have the chance to tell them again tomorrow. Remember what's truly important, family first and faith first. Not only have we taught our kids that people are secondary in importance, but we've taught them that God is somewhere way down on the priority list. We've sent them the nonverbal message that anything and everything else is more important than worship. We've taught them that anything and everything else is more important than commitment to the body of Christ, to serving the Lord and serving one another in the church. You know, I, I work with a lot of parents who are heartbroken when their kids as teenagers and, and young adults wander away from the church and they're left scratching their heads. But in some cases, it, it's that their kids are only following what their parents inadvertently taught them all along. Little League first. 
Soccer first, ballet first, piano first, school first, leisure first, golf first, boating first, skiing first, birthday parties first, bridal showers first, baby showers first. Listen, you tell your family, I'd love to come to your baby shower, but before I do, I'm going to go worship my God on the Lord's day. And if I'm a little late, just forgive me. And that's good preaching. The Bible says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. May God heal our broken thinking and may God heal our broken living in Jesus' name. Let's teach our kids family first, faith first. One thing that we can all say for certain is that every one of those precious little children went straight into the arms of Jesus. The Bible says that there's an age of innocence. When young children are unable to grasp spiritual truths, when young children die, they go directly to God. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and his arms were open wide to receive those little children Friday morning. There can be any comfort It's in the knowledge that for those little ones, the terror of that awful morning has now been forgotten completely. Today they're experiencing the glories of God's presence that we yet look forward to. But each one of us must make sure that we're prepared to get there. You know, when tragedies like this happen, sometimes people are quick to guess that God's judgment is involved. As if people got what they deserved. You remember it happened when Katrina hit New Orleans. Oh, those old heathens down there in New Orleans, they got what they deserved. Didn't sound so funny when they were saying the same thing about New York a month ago. Tragedy like this exposes the error of such thinking. How could a classroom of kindergartens possibly deserve this kind of horrific premature end to their lives. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 8, sometimes useless things happen on earth. Bad things happen to good people. In Luke 13, Jesus addressed two tragedies that happened in his day. A group of worshipers were massacred in a synagogue in Galilee, and then a tower fell in a place called Siloam and killed 18 people. And Jesus asked, he said, do you think that they deserved it? Do you think that somehow that they were more guilty than anybody else? Jesus said, no, they certainly did not deserve it. But each one must turn to God before it's too late. Beloved, I have to ask you this morning, are you ready? Have you made peace with your Creator? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Have you asked Him to forgive your sins by the blood He shed on Calvary? Have you invited Jesus into your heart? Have you received Him legitimately as your Lord and the real leader of your life? I have to ask you, is your relationship with God what it should be today? We used to sing an old hymn a long time ago, nothing between my soul and my Savior so that His blessed face I might see. Are your relationships with others what they should be today? Tragedies like this cause us to look inward and consider what's truly important, family first, and most importantly, faith first. What can I do when my heart is overwhelmed. Finally this, Pastor Jason, you can come help me. Rely on Jesus Christ. Rely on Jesus Christ. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock, Jesus, that is higher than I. Rely on Jesus. Lean on Jesus for stability. Psalm 125 says, Those who trust in the Lord are steady as Mount Zion, unmoved by any circumstance. 
Psalm 112 says, even in the darkness, light shines for the upright. Good will come to him. Surely he will never be shaken. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. Isaiah said, Lord, you give perfect peace to the one who trusts in you. Beloved, as you go back into the world tomorrow morning, as you go back to work, as you send your kids back to school, as your grandkids go back to school, lean on Jesus for stability. Have his peace. Rely on Jesus. Listen to him for direction. David said he will command his angels concerning you. They will guide you so that you don't hurt your foot on a stone. He who watches over you never slumbers or sleeps. He won't let your foot slip. Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and he will direct your paths. Rely on Jesus. Finally, look to him for salvation. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains are carried into the depths of the sea, the commander of the hosts of heaven is with us. The God of Jacob will save us. The angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him. He will deliver them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. As the mountains are around Jerusalem, so the Lord is around his people right now and forevermore. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. When my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I've asked Pastor Jason to share a song with us and after he does, we're going to gather together and we're going to spend some time in prayer this morning for the families of Newtown, Connecticut. Listen while Pastor Jason sings. Each tear 
that falls and hears his Come on, sing it one more time. He knows my name. He knows my name. Yes, he knows my name. He knows my every toe. your heads all over this place with me this morning we're going to pray together we're going to spend some a few minutes in corporate prayer for Newtown Connecticut but just before we do I have to ask this question this morning hundreds of families got up on Friday morning it's a beautiful morning it was a sunny morning life began as normal never knowing that in a split second where this, before the sun was even high in the sky, everything would change. 26 people got up Friday morning, not knowing that it was their last morning on earth. I have to ask this question this morning. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Jesus said they didn't deserve this tragedy. It didn't happen because they deserved it. But each one of us must turn to God while there's still time. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet your Creator and your Father? Have you made your peace with God? Have you asked Him to forgive your sins, to wash you by the blood He shed on the cross of Calvary? Have you invited Him into your heart? Have you asked Him to be your Lord and the legitimate leader of your life? Is there anything, anything between you and your Savior this morning? I wonder if there's someone here today and you're not sure that you're ready to go. You're not sure that if God called for you, you're not sure that when you went and stood before Him, whether He'd open His arms and welcome you into His presence for all of eternity. You want to be sure today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to ask Jesus Christ into your heart. Not going to embarrass you in any way, but if you're not sure, I want to pray with you today so that before you leave this place, you know that you know that you know that you're connected to your Father through Jesus Christ. While well, heads are bowed all over this place, that's you. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I just want to pray with you. And I want to ask you that you lift a hand up high wherever you are. I'm not sure I'm ready. Come on, there's one, two, there's three, there's four. Is there someone else? I'm not sure. There's another one. Five. We had three young ladies, beautiful young ladies, asked Jesus into their heart last night. Come on, who else? I'm not sure that I'm ready. And I want to be absolutely sure. There's another one. Come on, I'm not sure. And I want to be absolutely sure that I'm ready. I want to know. Come on, anybody else before we pray the prayer. I want to know. Lift your hand up high. I want to know. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on, everyone all over this place. Would you lift up your hands with me? And I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want everyone to follow. We're going to be like four friends. We're going to bring some people to Jesus this morning. Listen, when you pray that prayer, if you're praying that for the first time, when you pray that prayer, something is going to happen to you. God is going to come. The Bible says that he lifts us out of the kingdom of darkness and he translates us and puts us into the kingdom of the beloved son there's going to be a change that's going to start in your life this morning when you pray this prayer i'm going to lead i want everyone to pray and let's do this right now let's pray father come on in a great big voice father thank you for loving me thank you for sending your only son jesus thank you for coming you lived for me you died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you are the Son of God. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your cleansing. Wash my sins. 
Jesus, I turn away from my old life and I turn to you. Come into my heart. I receive you now as my Lord and the true leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give a big praise to the Lord in this place this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, if you're one of the ones that prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, before you leave this morning, make sure you come down right in the front. We have something that we want to give you that's going to help you get started on your new journey with Jesus. And we want to pray and we want to celebrate with you. Now, there's one last thing that I want to do this morning. Miracles really do happen. And we have about 10 minutes left on the clock. It never happened before, but it happened today. And this is what I want to do. Uh, you know what? It's a little bit uncomfortable when I ask people to do this at first. But if you do it, you'll be glad that you did. I want us to get in groups of three or four people, not more than five people. And I want us to spend some time interceding, praying this morning. Jesus said, whenever two of you agree in my name, touching anything on earth, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. Do you know we have the ability to send the peace of God to Newtown, Connecticut this morning. We have the ability to send the comfort, the God of all comfort to Newtown this morning. We have the ability to release the healing of God. Prayer and the love of God is the only thing that can fix this. This is what I want to do. I want to ask you to step out of your seats as many as you can. Uh, would you come right down to the front here? Uh, come all the way down. Come, come, if you would. I know it's a little uncomfortable, but it's okay. You'll be glad you did. Come all the way forward. If you're coming, come all the way forward so that those behind you can, can fill in this space here. Come all the way down. Okay, walk just a little faster. <laughs> I know third is used to starting late, but let's not make it any later than we have to. All right, this is what I want you to do. Just turn and face each other. Find a group of three or four people, uh, no more than five people. Pray with somebody that you don't know. Pray with somebody that, that you've never met them before. This is what I want to ask you to do. Let's pray for the moms and dads who lost their children, their beautiful children. Let's pray for the, the families that lost the school teachers, the principal, the school counselor. Let's pray for every bereaved family member, for the, the God of all comfort to come to them this morning. Let's pray for the little kids who heard things Friday morning that little kids should never have to hear, who saw things that little kids should never have to see. Let's pray for the policemen and the firemen and the EMTs. Let's pray for the coroners, for everybody that's responding to this tragedy. Let's pray for the town of Newtown and let's pray for our country, America that God would heal our land. Come on, would you do it? Let's make this a house of prayer for all nations these few minutes.
their prayers, oh God. Hear their voices, Lord. Just hearken to the voice. Holy One, just fall afresh in that place, oh God. They know that you are God. Let them know that you are God. Oh, our Savior, their provider. For you are the hope of all hearts, the hope of all hearts, Jesus. Mm. Just come heal this land of us. Just heal this land of God. Just open our eyes to see the reality of your kingdom, Lord. Just open our hearts, open our eyes to see all oh, the glory of your King, the glory of your one. Oh, Lord. Yes, we need you, God. We need you, Lord, God. Oh, how we need we're so desperate for you, Lord. So hungry, so hungry, Lord. Send revival, Lord. Send revival, Lord, in this land. Send revival, Lord. Let this nation rise. Let this nation rise. Sing it again with us. He knows my name. And he knows my name. And he knows my every thought. And he sees each tear that falls. And he Come on, lift up your voice. He knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my name. And he knows my every thought. He sees each tree that falls. And he hears me when. Let's pray. Oh God, hear our cry, oh God. Lord, when our hearts are overwhelmed, we cry out to you. God, we thank you this morning that you're aware, that you care, and that you're there, oh God. God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. We pray, oh God, that your comfort would come now to the parents, Lord, who are grieving the loss of their precious little children. God, to the families that are leaving the, the grieving the, the loss, God, of the principal and the teachers and the school counselor and the staff members, oh God. Lord, for the little children who saw things they should have never seen and heard things they should have never heard, I pray that you would take Holy Spirit, a magic eraser, and that you would erase right out of their memories, Lord, the sounds and the sights and the smells, oh God. We pray for your peace, Lord, as they sleep. We pray, God, that you deliver them from nightmares and night terrors, Lord God, and all of the trauma, Lord. Father, we pray for all of those that are working Lord, in some way to bring healing and help, God. We pray for the pastors in Newtown and for the churches, Lord, represented by those that lost loved ones and the members of that school community, oh God. We pray for your help. God, we pray for America. Lord, bring healing to our country. I pray, oh God, that you'd heal our land, Lord. God, save us. When our hearts are overwhelmed, lead us to the rock, Jesus. Now, God, as we go our own way today, I pray that the cloud of your presence would envelop us. Pray that your protection 
would surround us. I pray that your people tomorrow morning, that we would be like Mount Zion, steady and stable, Lord, and not moved. God, I pray your provision would accompany us. Pray that your providence would lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together again and everyone said, Amen. God bless you, everyone. Hug about 10 people before you leave church. Have a great week. Join us for Christmas caroling, 7 o'clock on Greenwich Avenue. Bless you.